that's what I was saying. So that's an example of you know Doug's safety activity of being. Uh, <laughs> we were never the same after that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> anyway, so I'd share that with you. So I'll hand the floor to you, Doug. I feel embarrassed now. <laughs> <laughs> so, a couple of things. This is going to just be a very fast tour of CNC A to Z. And I assume you probably don't know a lot about it. You might, you might not. I was going to do a presentation, but I didn't know about the, um, the display here. So most of it's just going to tell you about it. I will send, uh, I have your emails, so I will send notes off of what I talked about tonight. I'll have references to things like suppliers and little details that you might find useful, hopefully. So, <clears throat> CNC, uh, we all know computer controlled, computer numerically controlled machining. Uh, there's a bunch of steps associated with design. It's a little more complex than um, a laser printer or a, a laser cutter, but it can, you know, the steps we're going to go through are we're going to start with a sketched design. We're going to just talk about something and we're going to draw it here. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how to capture that in a particular tool that I like to use. I've used it for four or five years now. It's called SketchUp. And it's super simple to use, it's free. Uh, it's not the only one, there's a ton of other tools. But when you're starting out, I think it's really critical not to overwhelm yourself with the complexity of fusion and fillets and all sorts of stuff. You could design things that you could never actually manufacture until you actually have done a lot of machining. So I'm going to stick to CAD. And then CAD is basically a drawing. So once you have that drawing, you need to be able to cut it out. The process of converting a CAD drawing into uh, something that the machine will understand is called CAM, which is Computer Aided Manufacturing. And I'll describe in a little detail how that's done. There's a tool that plugs into SketchUp called SketchUp CAM, and it allows me to define the tool bits, the mill bits that we're going to use, and I'll talk about them as I'm going through this. And it allows the tool path to be defined, that is how the machine is going to cut through your material, either on the outside of your lines or on the inside of your lines, but basically machining your part for it. And then I have a little bit about CNC machine, and I'm going to demo it here so we can go right through this. But before we start all of that, why bother with CNC machine rather than 3D print, rather than laser? And Try them all. <laughs> and by far, I think I enjoy using the CNC machine more than any of the other ones. So, laser cutters, awesome, fast, simple to use. You just have to draw a PDF file, it cuts it. And it smells like burnt toast. Always, from here to eternity. You never get it clean, your fingers get dirty, and you're limited to the materials you can cut. 3D printing, um, for a beginner, the CAD process becomes three-dimensional. Once you're the three dimensions, unless you can visualize really well in three dimensions, it poses a serious problem for most people starting out. So I actually think it's more complex in a lot of ways than you can the CNC machine. The CNC machine offers um, high reliability like, and reproducibility. You apply a lot of energy into the cut. You've got a 500 watt motor here. All of that's going into that spindle and cutting your material. You can cut through half an inch of three quarters of an inch of wood, plywood, plastic, whatever. And it's fast mm -hmm. and it's clean and it's, as I say, it's reproducible. And it allows fairly fast iterations um, of design. But there are, the other thing I guess about it is with CNC, we buy flat stock material, so I buy sheet goods. So plywood, wood, plastic, but it all comes flat. So I don't really think so much about three-dimensional machining in the sense of I'm trying to sculpt it up for a rabbit in three dimensions. It would take the same amount of time as it would if I 3D printed it, but it's not really the purpose. I would cut outlines of shapes, mechanical pieces, and for instance, I'm, I'm working on this little piece at home. It's a 
part of a pick and place machine. And you can see a lot, this is just a two dimensional design. I've cut an outline, I've cut a hole in it, I've cut a partial thickness cut, it's called a pocket, and a bunch of Swiss cheese holes. And uh, it makes a really nice little part very quickly. 20 minutes I had this thing done. If I made a mistake and I want to do it again, I've only wasted this amount of material. Another 20 minutes, I have an exact duplicate of it. Um, so that's kind of cool. <coughs> and in terms of tolerance, you can send that around, but you can sort of see how tightly the parts fit together. You know, you get a really, really tight tolerance in, which you can not readily get with a 3D printer because there's a certain level of sag. Um, the other thing is with CNC machining, the material, because it's a solid sheet from the beginning, it's incredibly strong. So there's no lamination layers or anything in it. Maybe if you use plywood, there is. But I built this machine out of plywood and there's enough glue in there that you know, it, it makes for very, very strong parts. So I'm gonna move on to my philosophy on design. It's not everybody. Some people like to go right to the computer. I don't think that's the best solution, I think. Um, it's necessary to collect information in order to do design. So I use pen and paper so, <coughs> and a caliper. And then I pick up a bearing or whatever it is that I want to measure. And I'll measure the thickness of this because I need to know how thick this material is. That's 12.5 millimeters thick. If I bought it from a different manufacturer, it might be 12.6 or 12.3. But I need to know the exact thickness of it because if I'm going to machine down into it, I need to at least if I'm cutting through it, I need to go through the material. So you need to collect a bunch of information before you can start a design. So you know your material, plywood. They're all different vendors, slightly different thicknesses. They say it's 12 millimeters, maybe it's 11.9, maybe it's 12.1, who knows. Um, once I've collected that information and measured it, I then draw a paper sketch. So I don't know what you guys really want to design, but I'm just going to design a simple rectangle and show you what sort of thing. So uh, we'll make it say 20 millimeters wide by 30 millimeters tall. And then we're going to add, do you guys know what a um, counter bore is? Okay. When you're drilling, I can drill a hole or I can drill a hole that will allow me to recess the head of the bolt into it. So um, in this case, I haven't counterported. If I had counterported, that head would sit flush with the top of the plastic. So I'll just demo a counterbore hole here. So let's call it um, one eighth inch wide. So that's one section, five millimeters. And then the top of it, that bolt is probably about measure it. Three, so we're going to make that a six millimeter and this is why I don't want to be at the computer doing this because the computer just distracts you from actually just making your notes and figuring out if, you know if I had a ball bearing or a roller skate bearing or I want it to fit you know that little piece that fits together there and be tight I need to know the size of all of those tabs so that they actually fit, and I need to decide that in advance. So I'm going to make, for a counterbore, I'm going to drill one hole that goes down the middle, it'll be the diameter of the bit, and then it's going to cut the top big enough for this, which is six millimeters, and I'm going to go into it about three millimeters. So, and then I'm going to put one more hole slightly offset here. So I'll make that five. Five. This is all arbitrary. Uh, that's down the center line. That's my first kick at a ultra simple design. Now, clearly you don't need to do that. You could have gone right to the computer when you design something as simple as that. But as soon as you try and do this, I need to know, well, how thick is this material? How long are these bolts? Where are they positioned? I need the data sheet for this linear bearing. I need to decide how this piece is going to fit on here, how much clearance there is, because a lot of detail 
the fastest way for me to do it is on paper, and then I'll sit back and think about how these parts go together. Um, like there's two parts of the system together. But for now, I'm just going to do that nice simple part. That was my very rapid design. We're good with this so far? Yeah? Okay. From here, that computer will not understand this design. So what I have to do is capture the design in a CAD program. We use SketchUp. It's, as I say, free. I think you buy that. So I'm going to go over there and demo how I create. Uh, you see it pop up here. All right, just minimize it. It's still here. There you go. So I just opened you know, you're fine there. I just opened up SketchUp just beforehand. I haven't saved it as anything. So when I start, I drew this um, shape that's 20 by 30 millimeters. It's a rectangle. Milling bits, the one that I would recommend you start off with is like a 1 8 inch mill end mill. An end mill is not a drill. It's a flat bottom thing that looks a little bit like a drill but it actually cuts on its side, so if it passes through material, it's cutting on the edge of the bit. So if I use a 1 8 inch end mill, I know that I have to be offset from this axis. This corner here that you can see is 0, 0, 0. Uh, X, Y, Z, it's the corner of like where I'm pointing there, where the green, blue, and uh, red lines intersect. That's the origin of the 0. Since the bit is 1 8 of an inch wide, 3.175 millimeters, I need to be offset from that a little bit. I know this. So, and I don't want to be too close to the edge because I don't want to hit any of my fixturing, which I'll explain later. So what I do when I always start off is I start drawing little lines here. So I'm going to make that five uh, in the lower right hand corner, right above my Apple laptop. You see the length that says five. I just type five in there and I hit enter. So that's five that's millimeters. Inches, sorry. Oh. Just do um, okay. window. Window style. Uh, Long info. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been really big. Got to get out of fractions. Yeah. Yeah, decimal. Sorry, it's my computer. I'm in the last, uh, in the yeah. last several decades. I, I'm not up to speed. All right. We're going to delete that. Yeah, that would have been a little bit bigger than my machine can handle. <laughs> so five millimeters in and five millimeters up. That'll give me basically a quarter inch border along the edge of the design. So we said it was 20 millimeters wide. So if I zoom in, I'm using the middle um, rolly button there. I can now measure over 20 and I can go up 30 and I can draw the shape of the outline that I want to cut. Oops. Doesn't matter. It's got a very twitchy, uh... This tool is for dimensioning. You can actually put this here and click up here. And now we see it's 30 millimeters, which is what I told you I was going to do. And we can put that one there. You don't have to put dimension on it. Later, though, uh, especially if you have multiple piece parts, you're going to want to know what your design is. Uh, you'll want to know that, you know, say you have a tab that's fitting in like that little piece of tab around. That was a 20 millimeter wide tab. Well, you know you need a 20 millimeter wide hole. If you have to go back to old designs and look it up, it's not so much fun, so I tend to document it here. And then I said I was going to put um, a few other features in here. One of them was a hole in the corner. We'll make it five millimeters in and five millimeters down. And half of that is 10, and we'll go up by five. So. I'm going to put a hole here, it's four millimeter. That's not going to leave a lot of boundary on it. And um, 
I'm just going to mark this, but it's not actually going to do anything, so I'm going to do this right now. So this low lower hole was the one that I was thinking I was going to put a counter bore on, and I'm just going to write that. And at this point, I've now done exactly what I did when I drew it down. And I should probably save it because every once in a while things crash. So save and document the other desktop. Yeah, desktop, desktop. Yeah. I think desktop. So I, I gave you a dark folder. It's at the top. Okay. And there's the dark folder. And we're going to call this. Um, sorry, let me turn that off. The demo. So that's it. We've just captured the design. That was the computer-aided design part. Now, to be fair, you could have just sat here and done a very simple part and draw it here. But you can also do really cool things like reshaping it. We'll, if we have enough time, we'll get back to that. I just want to take you end-to-end, -end, make this part as a quick demo. So once you've got the design, we now have to tell the machine how to cut this. And that's the cam part. And Darcy's been nice enough to include this row of tools right down here, this uh, one row. So we start off um, with, and it's called SketchuCam, and it's computer-aided manufacturing. So feed rates, that's way too fast for me. I'm just a slow guy, so I'm going to go 600 um, millimeters and maybe... The material thickness of that piece of plastic that I have mounted on there is 12.5 millimeters thick. Remember I said you needed that piece of paper with all those notes on it? That's why we wrote them down, because I need to be able to fill this out. Every job is going to be unique. The cam process depends on which mill bit you've chosen, the thickness of your material. Those feed rates are how fast the spindle is moving across the surface of the material as it's cutting through it. The um, plunge rate is how fast it's going to go with the dead axis down into the material. So the diameter of the bit is 3.175 millimeters, that's one eighth of an inch. Tabs, we'll put them in there and I'll show you what those are. Uh, everything else looks good. We need to <laughs> set this as an overhead gantry. You can see that this, the spindle on the machine on the right hand side is above the work surface. The work surface is that white piece of plastic and the spindle is um, directly above it. So that's called an overhead gantry. Because I don't want to plunge through their 12 and a half millimeters and just grind through it, I'm going to do multi-pass, which is brings me down to this corner and I'm going to say each pass is two millimeters thick. So once I've... <laughs> Fast demonstration, I agree. Um, that's all I need to tell the machine in order to convert the CAD file into a, a CAM output, and the CAM output is called G-code. Why have I given it these numbers? These numbers get translated into the G-code output file and tell the machine how fast it can go. So it will only accelerate up to the speeds that I've said. It won't go any faster than that because if I put a block of aluminum in there, you cannot go on this machine at 600 millimeters per minute or you'll break the bit. If you went at 20 millimeters per minute, and I certainly wouldn't plunge in two millimeters into a hunk of aluminum and went, Bleh, it will break the bit. We would plunge in 0.1 millimeters and just slowly surface it off. Uh, on a soft, soft material, if I used wax and was making jewelry, yes? How much are those bits worth? Six bucks, roughly. Uh, and they could be a lot more. Six to sixty. Six to sixty, yeah, exactly. So I, the one-eighth inch bits are pretty robust. You will break them. I buy them in tens because, um, yeah, because I do break them. And you break them for the honest reasons. And, and breakage is because you hit the fixed string, and the fixed string are the little screw holes that are holding down my work material, and I've not set things up right, or the machine goes out of control, and I use inches instead of millimeters, and I'm thinking it's going to cut this much, and it decides it's going over to the edge, and I don't hit the stop button fast enough, and it, the bit collides with a piece of steel, and then I will break it. Um, the other one is your feed rate or your speed. Uh, 
if it's not set correctly for the bit, your bits, uh, if you use smaller bits, like um, I'm saying start here at 1 8 inch bits, they're rigid, they don't break so easily. Darcy uses 1 32nd bits, I'm afraid of those, they're like little needles. <laughs> I like the 16th inch bits, you can do some really fine work with them. 1 32nd, you can do jewelry with them, like earrings and incredibly light things. My go-to bit these days is um, 2.3 millimeter bit. And the reason I do that is it's just a little smaller than a 1 8 inch bit. I can directly use um, and tap the material afterwards for 3 millimeter screws, which I like. But if you happen to use Imperial <coughs> system, 1 8 inch, you still probably want to be a little less, so you need a slightly smaller bit for your holes. So I'm just going to click OK. And and like that thing. So why did I tell it the diameter of the bit? So there are two types of cuts that you need to potentially make on this design. One is in this corner here, I want to cut on the inside of the circle. That's a four millimeter diameter hole, but my bit is only three millimeters. So it's gonna to have to go around the perimeter of it. Because the, if you're into woodworking, you know that there's a saw curve. So when a saw goes through a piece of wood, the blade is, say, an eighth of an inch wide. That's going to create a kerf in the wood. And when you're measuring, you measure a line. And you always mark which side of the line you want to cut on. Do I want to cut on the left of the line or on the right of the line? So the cam process offsets one half the bit diameter so that the tool path is either inset or outset from a line. So if I want to cut a hole, I use the inset cut, I come over here, I click it, and see the blue line there, um, just there? That blue line is where the actual bit is going to go, and because the bit is 1 16th inch to the outside of it, when you cut along that center line, it's going to cut exactly on the 4 millimeter line. Now we're going to give you one other kind of cool um, the counter bore. So I said we were six millimeters in diameter. And still that will do. Um, the counter bore set the depth. This is how deep I want that thing to go. Let's go with uh, five millimeters deep. We'll really bury that. And then the whole diameter is zero for the current depth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the top of the material six millimeters in diameter and I'm going to come down five millimeters deep into it and then I'm going to have a hole that goes right down concentrically down the center of it and that'll be the diameter of the bit. And I'm going to click that tool, come over here, click it and it creates a weird little inside cut as well as an outside cut. Um, and then the final thing is we want to cut out the part when we're done so I'm going to click that tool, which is the outside cut. So instead of cutting on the inside of that rectangle, which would be a part that was not 20 by 30, it would be 20 less 3.175 and 30 less the same. Um, so we're going to cut to the outside. And one last step generates G-code. Actually, before the, I do that, I like to save because sometimes it blows up. And then... Uh, DougDemo.cnc, that sounds like... Maybe desktop if you want. Just oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <coughs> bottom link, right in that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You don't want me to pollute... No, I don't mind where you put it. It's just, it's just easier on this. Yeah. So, all those little E's were it generating the file. Um, I do a save. Because it won't let me quit otherwise. Because it remembers something about this. And I can close that. Now, I'm going to... I'll put that in for you if you like. Uh, actually, so, no, it's this one. one? Okay. That one is way too much stuff on. It's way back here. Yeah. So. Yeah. so that was the end of the cam part. So it's pretty easy, but the cam is actually probably the most useful part. The output of that little file that I saved at the end is a sequence of stuff called G-code. You hear about it a lot. You rarely look into it until you've been doing this stuff for quite a while. But that output file... G-code is a numerically controlled set of step and direction um, 
So the code would look like set the speed that you're going to pass through the material as well as where you are and where you want to go. So it sets line segments that you're going to move to. The interpretation of those um, G code commands is all entirely managed by the machine for the GUI interface in front of the machine, but basically. Did you put that on I, there? I happened to oh. copy it. Does it look like I did okay there? Yeah. It's eight. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. 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 That should be good. So, so on. So we've done a paper design. We've then moved forward. We did um, the computer aided design capture of that. We canned it, which is turn it into G code. I have G code on here. I plug it into my laptop. We will have uh, some sort of user interface. The ones that um, I have several machines. One that's widely available is a thing called Mach 3. And if you buy a China CNC, you will get a copy, an illegal copy of Mach 3. It runs on an XP type computer with a parallel printer port. It has tons of features, more than you could possibly want. But it also needs that parallel printer port. So you, grow up, you always end up with a brick beside your CNC machine because you have to run it. Um, the other options, which is just as valid and open source, is to use a piece of software called GStreamer, and it connects to a thing called a Gerbil controller. And that pairing, the GStreamer sends data to the Gerbil controller, and the Gerbil controller sends out seven direction pulses, which turn the motors in the X, Y, Z axis. So cross axis is X, uh, Y is going into the machine back and forth, and the Z axis is vertical. Uh, I can't project this, but I'm just going to go and find this file. Start the game. So just demo dot two. The next. Um, so you've created your file. Now the machine is kind of dumb. It doesn't know anything about whether you put material on here. It doesn't know where the spindle is when you start off. Maybe you have limits, maybe you don't, maybe it's zero or not. But inevitably what you want to do is you want to move the spindle through manual jog instructions to where you want it to be. So I can, every user interface, whether it's the GStreamer or Mog or this, they all have the ability to move the machine around under this computer control. So I can go down a step or out a step, right? When I'm happy with where it is over the workpiece, it, you know, if I put the workpiece back three inches, I can move the machine back three inches before it starts. It's all in reference to that origin that I drew when I did the CAD file. Zero, zero is the beginning reference. All of the code goes in the positive x, y quadrant. You know. So the zero is all moving up or across to the z axis sometimes. So let's see if we can do some cutting. So, power supply box. I have a uh, spindle, a uh, brushless spindle controller. Unfortunately, it's not wired in yet to my controller. Otherwise, I could exactly set the speed of it. Right now, it's running with probably 16,000 RPM. Uh, how many RPM? Sorry? How many RPM? About 15 or 16,000 RPM. It's, it's a little fast for plastic, but it's not cool. It's not super fast. So I'm going to bring... So in the zeroing operation, um, remember I said the origin is zero, zero. So it's X, Y, Z are zero. So right now, I can zero the machine at this location. And the bed is floating in space. So if I run this job from here, it, it thinks that the surface of the material is floating right there in space. So this is going to be what I would call an air cut. It won't actually cut the material because the origin is offset almost three quarters of an inch off of the material. So if I start the job, it lifts up, it comes down, it starts 
cutting, and then we're going to just solve that problem. We're going to build a new final thing. So, move zero, move one, faster or slower, you can use control key to move them more rapidly or more slowly. Can you, you can hear it about now? Okay, it's just touched the surface of the material, it's a little bit below the surface. Um, so, I'm going to set the zero there. Oh, is that the other way to set the zero? You mean, where on that piece of plastic? Yeah. Okay, well, after I've used that piece of plastic for a while, it's so cheap. There's holes all over it from previous jobs. So I've moved the position of zero to where there's sufficient material that I can cut it out without cutting into a hole that's left over the room. So in this case, it's very arbitrary where I put it. But zero to the surface of the material is critical for you to not do it. You're doing a multi piece uh, construction. Um, you know, all the then have to run across an arm and say, well, if you want to make changes, not what you do, but what you think you have to change your design to be able to do projects or that thing that you would like you'll, to you'll have, with, Without having zeros on your machine, like limit switches on your machine to solve it, that you have to do it, you'll probably never get it accurately for that condition. If I turn off the machine, it will lose a zero. If you lose zero, you're done. Um, you can get close, but you will never get it precisely on target. Yeah, that was a weird big part. Yeah, you, you might as well try to do it, but that's the joy of this thing. So let's say I did screw up. Whatever the job length is, three minutes. Okay. Do another one. Okay. Another three minutes, don't worry about it. So I kind of like that aspect of it. So let's see this thing go. And Rich is going to be thrilled to find out that I like plastic chips here. Okay, so that's doing the um, counter board. So what it did is it drilled the hole down and then came back and did this weird shape. Again, it keeps steering the chips away. I, I'm actually not going to chip away that sometimes up the smooth of the, um, this is not the most recent bit, it's kind of an old one, it's not super sharp. So up the flute, it starts to collect on it, and I like to knock them loose just so that they don't melt uh, with this plastic. With wood, probably not an issue. With other material, mileage varies. Oh, I forgot to put a tab on here. Darcy didn't remind me, he's snickering at me because he knows the thing's going to blow out of here. <laughs> I don't uh, use it, so uh, get ready to pause it. This is worthy of breaking a bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I looking 
concerned. The reason I'm looking concerned is when I said embarrassing, I forgot to put the tab on, and I forgot to tell you guys about the tab. If you think about it, that final cut on the cam press that went around the part cut all the way through. So what happens? What's holding this in place? This guy has a ton of bolts holding it down. This guy has nothing <coughs> holding it down. So what's happened is, as soon as that came loose, the material gets sucked into the blade, the mill blade, and then it starts to grind. So if you leave a tab, you can recut it. I'll have a tab for design. What it would do is um, leave a little piece of plastic at the bottom here, which you can set the thickness of, say two millimeters thick, quarter inch wide, and then when it cuts out, it's still held in place by these tiny little pieces, so that it doesn't. But well, you can see the as you pass it around, you can see what a counter bore looks like. That's the one with the bigger hole and the smaller hole in it. So you could actually pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. Did that more or less make sense? So that took almost an hour, 45 minutes, and I did a lot of time. But what you see is I can sit down, sketch something, design it, cut it, bang out a part that, oops, that hole should have been 4.3 millimeters in diameter, recut it in another two minutes, and from now on out, me changing that design, I just add a little feature, we can start moving things, um, we can add more detail, we can curve corners, we can do fancy little pockets like this. This is uh, another. Yeah. Why am I using the white plastic material? I really like the mouse boots on Richard's floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's hyperallergenic. It's not. Uh, it's really easy to cut. It's strong. It's structural. It doesn't create dust. It's toxic. Uh, if you have allergies, it's an awesome material. What do you source your material? So, no, Canvas is, well, I can if I'm in a hurry, but I have a list I said I would send out yeah. the, the suppliers. My preferred supplier in Ottawa would be Plastec, <coughs> but you have to buy a fair bit from them, and it, um, like sheets. So four by eight sheet is $107 for a quarter inch material, and about $180 for a half inch material. What kind of plastic is it? Is it? It's high density polyethylene. Oh, yes. uh, but it's odorless, and as I said, the dust and stuff, it, it makes a really good surface, it's slick. If you're making CNC machines or other plastic parts, it's really easy to like a really glide in the surface. Um, Did you say, what is the plastic place? Um, Plastec, which is out at Carp Road. Okay. And there's another one called Johnson Plastic in Laval, which might be underwater now. Um, <laughs> But I, I'll go down there once or twice a year to buy my stash of plastic drugs and we spend a lot. So like, Duck buys weeks. 500 pounds at a time, for real. Yeah, I buy 500, 500 pounds because <laughs> about eight sheets of plastic and it's uh, a lot of plastic. And then we divvy it up and give people their one square foot and just look at it at a price. But, but if you want in a hurry, um, local. Also, uh, if you're in a hurry, you can go to Canis practice, Canis Plastic oh, to their at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> well, you don't have to go at 3 a.m. Just go after hours. They throw it in their dumpster, and they throw out some awesome material, like lots of really good plastic and cheap. Yeah. Uh, do you mean the position of your machine, or is the other one at typically that kind of work? I don't know. Let Darcy talk about the, uh, the distinctions of various machines. The, the short is... Um, they're both really precise. The difference is how rigid they are and how fast you can go. And if you run a weaker machine at lower speeds, it won't be a problem. So it's sort of like if I'm filing something, I can just grind into it because it's a lot of physical effort and deflection occurs and all sorts of things. If I just use a nail file to do it long enough, you will take it down. So speed, is one of the differences. Um, and then overall, when these machines will loosen up over time, so you can tune them. Other questions? Because I'm just gonna stop there and let Darcy have a little spin at it. Uh, and then we'll have a little more time at the end to chat and ask questions if people have anything they want to know about. Or
Well, I'd say just leave the floor open for your questions, and then we do a, 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 do a little brief social, then we'll go on to the next presentation. Sure. Excuse me, can you Yeah, so I'm crazy. I, I wouldn't, um, I, I wanted to understand how the gory details of the mission were. I had access to a bunch of exchange missions, uh, so I had tools that would allow me to make this mission. So I did design it. Um, I used interesting hardware. The, this is a square rail machine, it's very rigid. Um, I used a bit of aluminum in there and solar heater. I designed my own controllers, my own software interface. It's kind of a a long-term project, but it's not about making CNC machines. It's about designing the machines so that I can learn how to work. I have another workhorse at home, which is a 64 inch for big aluminum one. But I mean, this one was targeted as something portable that I could bring out, hopefully, to summer parks this summer. Uh, and, you know, it's light enough. I've, I've got it down that it's, it's portable. And I want to be able to bring it out and demo and work on things. You know, if you find an electric out of it, I can run this. It's a pretty neat thing. How, 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 how about the, what the kind of lifetime for that spin needle? The spindle? Yeah. The spindle, Darcy has had a spindle. He ran his for, what, eight years? before? Yeah, started? almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Yeah, so there's two classes of spindles. This is a slightly better one, which is why it was slight. You might argue it wasn't quiet, but when it's just running by itself, it's too quiet. It's a brushless motor. So if you, two types of motors, one brushed has carbon contact in it, it's a commutator. They rattle and they wear out, the carbon will wear out. This is electronic commutation. There is no, uh, no spot gas or anything to control the conductor. Semiconductors turn the field on. What I like about, and the one thing that I think is a good feature, when I add the speed control, I can pulse width modulate, that is, set the speed under computer control to allow that. It's an interface in here, but if they run it at 10,000 RPM, it will send out pulses and run it at 10,000 RPM. But I can slow a brushless spindle down, whereas a brushed motor, not so much. And this has a, a second wiring that's called a Hall effect sensor that actually measures the velocity. So that's important when you want to cut metal. You want lower velocities, not higher, before you overheat the disk, even with oil. Okay. Is everybody silent because they're just going like, uh-oh, uh, trouble? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. One last question. Yep. Uh, across, there's yep. one more expensive. That's going to be the next set of questions for Darcy to answer. They, they come in different. I could buy one cheaper than I built, but that wasn't necessarily my purpose. My purpose was to experiment with different technologies, to design boards, and do all of the nitty gritty, to understand all of the details of it, because I like designing machines. But I'll more let Darcy do that. More more okay. At the start of your, uh, of your uh, CAD, you yep. did those uh, five millimeter or whatever the offsets yep. were yep. because it was the thickness of your bits. Yep. And then the, the intent, I think the intent was that when you, when you move your bit over, <laughs> that, that's going to define basically the the, the uh, corner of, of your that, that's correct. correct. And um, had you not done that, you, you would have just moved it because because I think you were saying that you don't actually care where you're putting it no. because you, don't, you didn't actually need that precision in it. Is that so correct? so that, that is correct. Now the other thing is, Sketch Attempt has a quirk about it. If you try and draw something that doesn't sit in the positive XY, aka the upper right hand corner of the drawing, if you go over those origin lines, Sketch Attempt won't generate a complete line. Like, you can, you can have your whole drawing there and you skip that, <coughs> which is miserable. So I tend to like offset it five millimeters Oh, generous. I usually do three, but since it's here, I lost material there. I don't really care about the sketch. Sometimes I'll bring, so typically I'll bring my zero point right up to the edge of the material. So if you think of a piece of material, say it's quite small and you've got a clamp, you need enough room around the edge of it. Five millimeters is not a lot of room, so if the material is long enough, it's no problem, but if it's not, you need that edge or your tabs aren't holding it easily. If you cut reach the zero line, your tabs are now holding in air. It just won't work. 
Mr. Yeah. Yes. And the other thing, obviously, I think you said you were going to go back and show us how to do the tabs. How to do the tabs? Sure. Or you can use for tabs. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'll just bring this up here. So uh, I need my duck folder, your duck folder. Yeah. So I'll just bring the, the folder up here. Yeah. Oh, there it is up there. So you're saying, let me open the file that you made. And, uh, well, what's happening is um, I just changed the monitor around, and I'm just getting disoriented with the mouse. Here we go. I got that. And it's loading. And here it comes. While we're doing that, any other questions that we can work on? Oh, uh, there it is. Okay. So there's a tab so, tool here somewhere. So there's a. Well, actually, go go up to the um, sketch cam setup, right at the very top. Oh, set the tab width first. Yeah, and just I think it was set at three quarters of an inch, but I don't really. Yeah. There. So. Yeah. That tab. That's three quarters of an inch. You want how much? What do you want yeah, on there? Yeah, no, that's good. But, you want that? Okay. Yeah. But what I want to do is the um, inside of hundred percent. I'm going to usually set that inside overcut to 105 percent. This here? Yeah. Oh, five. Yeah. Now the reason for that is, I measured this material. It is 12.5 millimeters thick. If my zero wasn't quite right, or even if it was perfect, this material is slightly plastic. It is plastic, but by that I mean it's really compliant. So as the mill bit comes down. You will get a wafer thin skin sometimes being pushed down into the lower uh, bed and it never actually releases the part. So you're left with something that just pulls it in place. I cut it out with a knife, but it leaves a little bit of the flash on the end of your part, which you might want to get rid of. If you go 105%, the drill bit's going to go right through all of that and into the wasteboard. I didn't tell you about the wasteboard. Rather than show up my machine, I have a, a thin piece of wood underneath this. Right? Truly a waste, it just sits under there, it gets chewed up. When I'm done with it, when it looks like Swiss cheese, I throw it out and another one under there. But rather than our surface issue. If you have an aluminum um, bed, you definitely don't want to be grinding your aluminum bed. It's kind of a nuisance in the living room. So you want to have a, at least a quarter inch of um, material on your work surface. Okay, Darcy's going to demo the tabs? Okay. a tab. So there's a tab tool right there, yeah. and then now I tell it where not to cut. So it maybe this is right there. there we go. So it's like that yeah. maybe, and it could be anywhere like yeah. here. Would that be enough, or would you? I would do one on the side sometimes. Maybe one here or something. Yeah. Right about here. And then that's it. Yeah. So those tabs are areas that will not get entirely cut. There was thickness to that too, so right. Yeah. Oh, let's see here. So you see, go up here. There should be a piece of tab going just usually about 90% of the thickness of the material. Um, that's here. And then tab width tab depth. and depth. Yeah, that's way too much. I would go 90%. Um, so that leaves 10% of the material. So if the material is 12 and a half millimeters thick, that would leave a 1.2 millimeter thick tab. If you set the zero below 12 and a half millimeters, like you're, you're starting to thin that out. So you might want to make it whatever. When Darcy cuts thin, thin materials, or when I cut thin, thin materials, I'll just let them <coughs> fly loose. So if I'm cutting one eighth inch thick material or smaller, I'll just generally let them pop out just to blow away. Um, and, and cut them out. Yeah, um, how come you have to like um, on that tool it's carried about that your style, like on that machine it's a gantry, so the XYZ is all in a gantry style, and that one over there is the uh, the X and Z. Why did like why, why did they do that? Because the flat voice tool was actually an inverted machine. It actually cuts um, the stock was a piece of cardboard with foam that would run through the machine, and the machine was cutting from the bottom, not from the top. So when we talk about the gantry machine, whether you move the table or not, it was, the bit was coming from the top down versus the bottom up. 
it's a, again a quirk feature. It's a weird feature because flat, flat boys design uh, model airplanes. Yeah, they, it was a yeah. special machine. You fell yeah. enough to shoot a bone. So I have two sets of notes uh, that I'll send off. One of them is a description of sort of CAD, CAM, design, all of those aspects. The other one is just a short sketch up which shows all of the icons and, and what I just did in front of you. Basically the same sort of design, but to give, give you an idea of what it is, as well as all of the links. Good? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so this is this is the guy software version, not your man. This is not my software, no. No, it doesn't. No, that one was my software. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't display it. Do you have mock on your machine? No, on this one. No, sorry. Okay. Do you no, don't worry. Um, yeah. Well, I have candle here, which is Our another one. No. No a candle, which is a. Uh, I pop it up if you want. I, I'm pretty sure I haven't. I thought so, I had it on my desktop here. There was one other thing I was going to just mention, and it was um, yeah. So I ran you through all of these steps really quickly to give you an idea of what it involves. The design you guys can manage, pen and paper, no problem. If you keep to the simplest of tools, just like I showed you. You know, drawing circles, drawing lines, drawing rectangles. Don't do 3D design. Do not use SketchUp to do 3D design. Later. <laughs> I can show you better tools later. When you start off with those simple tools, you'll learn enough about how to run the job and get it all the way through. The CAM process becomes simpler. You can't, it, it gets harder to design things that you can't actually manufacture. And I keep getting told that I should be using Fusion and this program and that program. To be quite honestly, I can spin out a design faster in this because I already know the tools. And it's really for those that you do an amazing amount of things. Five years I've been doing this one, you can do it even longer. You're still using it. We have a few different back ends and things that we use to do the cam, but the tool is more it has issues, but it will do pretty much anything that you could possibly want to make. If you want to so don't bite off more than you can chew. If you buy a new machine, this is the only other thing that I would say in terms of simplifying your life. Make sure you come out to Hack 613. I'm not plugging Hack 613, but don't try and tune your machine and set up the... <laughs> when, when you get a new machine from China, or you build it yourself, or you build one of these, you have to set a bunch of parameters how many steps for your separate motor to this, and then you have to map it back to feet and speed rates and, and calibrate your machine. You do it once in your life. It's incredibly complex because you've never done it again, or ever before, and you'll never go back to it, or unless you buy another machine. So you're better off leveraging some people who have been doing this for a while, and there's a few of us who've done it, and we were more than help, you know, the help is, is readily available, that doesn't cost you anything. But it's really important not to get discouraged by trying to do this yourself. That one step is tricky. Okay. I guess, um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just take a, a 10 minute social and then uh, I'll start another presentation shortly. <laughs> Water. I did. Yeah. Nice to meet you here. Oh. I work with you. I work with you. Have fun yet? Yeah. My intention was to come here and see the whole thing, but it looks like I missed the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about it. Pretty attractive.
Yeah, so that was just a demo of here where they get a fight. They quick fight. Physical thing just appeared. And you know there's a job of all the machines to buy. So it becomes kind of a demo. And then after that, uh, we're just going to get out of here. It's good to know all of this uh, uh, meetups. Uh, okay. It's like for robots and stuff that I've running like hard stuff with your arduinos and everything and I left them all in Australia. Yeah. Well, I have a ton of arduino stuff and never even some of the things that I uh, I'm a bit of an addict and I go through phase and order all this crap from China and when it comes in I can't remember why I bought it. So I have it all organized, I have a little box and I have a little things like that. But I mean I have every process you can imagine and little FPG boards and stepper motors and all sorts of driver boards and like uh, cool because I was gonna buy a whole bunch more so well if you have some I'm just going to show you that. Yeah. Always fun. What sort of stuff you have to build? Uh, well, what I had before was like uh, RC cars that I turned on and now we're going to the RC and then like the cash. I wanted to do One of the guys that comes to the Maker 612 one guy has something that solves Rubik's Cube. So it's been around and solves it. has cameras. Another car has like one of these grippers and I was working on it. Google. That all sounds easy. Yeah, yeah.